So, um, one thing I was really interested to see in the introductions there was uh, a desire for societal impact. And this is societal impact on a big scale. Today, uh, three and a half billion people live in cities or urbanized areas of some kind on the planet. Uh, by 2050, projection is that that number will rise to seven billion. In other words, in the next 40 years, we're going to build as much urban capacity as already exists today in total on the planet. That's why cities are a really interesting, really important kind of topic today. So we have the opportunity to build new cities, uh, which are equivalent to everything we have today, um, using new technologies, new principles, uh, and new methods. So this is a, a really fertile area for a lot of imagination uh, from many disciplines, from architects, from designers, from urban planners, engineers, uh, sociolog sociologists, political scientists. Um, it is, um, it's a hugely interesting area. So I, I'll sort of walk into this a little bit and, and how we got into this mess. Um, back in 2005 or six, um, our chairman, Sam Parmesano at the time, was asking the company, asking the employees and their friends, their families, and some of our business partners, you know, what are the really important problems that, that IBM ought to go work on? Um, in particular, he was looking for things that would connect IBM back into society. Um, you might or might not recall, uh, we used to sell um, laptops. Uh, laptop computers was the last in our line of PCs. Uh, we had gradually sold that business off to a Chinese company called Lenovo, which has done quite nicely with it. By the way, I, I learned a couple of months ago that in China, people think that Lenovo bought IBM, um, but we haven't quite closed that deal yet. Um, but we'd come to a point where IBM was sort of hidden. There was no product, no service that IBM provided that the average human being was ever going to come across. Uh, we were sort of hidden away inside the data center, invisible. Um, and the chairman wanted to get us sort of back out into society again. And, and so we ran a, an online chat session for uh, all the employees and, and uh, families and uh, some of our customers, some of our partners for three days to ask what kind of problems should come out of that. And it, it sort of raised, uh, among many other things, a lot of interest in energy and environment, which is where I came into that story. Um, but it also made us aware here of what we'd actually built by that time, by uh, early 2000s, um, in terms of networks, uh, services run over those networks, devices connected to those networks, and, and how that had transformed a lot of commercial organizations. And the byproduct from that is that uh, there are many, many kinds of transaction systems that have been built around the world for commercial purposes that have very revealing side effects, what our friends at Google would call the data exhaust. And so Google looks at the query stream to find out what is it that people are asking about, because presumably these are topics that are of great interest at the moment. Uh, what you can also do by looking at information streams, transaction streams that are related to real world events is you can get a picture on what is it people are actually doing. Um, and that was the, the genesis of a lot of our thinking about uh, what to do in cities. Many times I'll go and talk to, to a, a city that is thinking that it would like to be smarter, whatever that might mean, uh, and they say, well, what kind of data, what sort of sensors should we be putting out? And what kind of data should we be collecting here? And I say, well, go and look on your disk drives because you've got a lot of it already. Uh, these systems collect enormous amounts of data, which is used for you know, some transaction, charging a credit card account, um, and then it just sits there until it gets scrubbed off. And that's uh, a very good place to start the game. So here's this sort of basic model uh, that emerged from a study I did around 2007, 2008, which is uh, where we are today is we, we have, uh, in the physical world, embedded many different kinds of sensors. So some of these are what we might think of as engineering sensors. <coughs> they are uh, the, the tra traffic sensors buried in the, in, the, in the roads. They are the security sensors on a building like this. Um, 
but they are other things. They are the people sensors. They are the, the information that we kind of radiate as we go about our, our daily lives. Um, and those sensors are uh, increasingly connected through networks, wireless networks in many cases, um, into the, uh, the internet. Um, and we can then capture those uh, little pieces of data, integrate them into some form of a, a data model and a taxonomy, and now start to create a digital world, um, uh, which is a kind of mirror world, right? It's the mirror world of what is going on in a city, for example. But now we have a virtual copy of it. And that copy, that virtual copy, we can do lots of interesting things. Uh, we can make time run backwards. We can look instantaneously at a huge breadth of information, seeing information across an entire city that no individual human being can see. Uh, but we can also make time run forward. And we can ask questions about what will the future of this city be in uh, minutes, hours, uh, perhaps even decades as well. So a, a common example of this kind of thing, this is actually taken from Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, where I was in, in March. Um, many, many places around the world put, will put a GPS system on the bus. The buses know where they are now. Uh, you put a wireless system on the bus, now the bus can tell the rest of the world where it is. And from that, at your bus stop, you can get a sign that says, you know, your bus will be here in two minutes, or three minutes, or whatever. Um, so that's just sort of basically capturing and, and redistributing uh, information. But you can do more interesting things with that because, as I'll show you later on, uh, it may be that you're waiting for the wrong bus. It may be that there is another bus that will come earlier than the one you're thinking of waiting for. Um, that would get you to your destination uh, uh, quicker or more simply, perhaps. That led us to this sort of basic um, abstraction. Uh, we call it three eyes. Uh, the world is becoming instrumented. Uh, it is becoming interconnected, which is both networks and data integration here. Um, and it's becoming intelligent. Uh, we can apply uh, now analytics to these volumes. Some of these are, are very large volumes of data that are being collected. Um, the largest one that comes to mind that we have been connected to in this kind of area at least uh, is with Southern California Edison utility in Southern California uh, that is deploying of the order of 10 million smart electric meters. <clears throat> they wanted the system built so that they could query each one of those meters every five minutes. They're not actually doing it every five minutes, but the system's built to allow them to do it. Um, if you roll up those numbers, you end up with the best part of a petabyte per day. Now, 90% of that is in the headers, but you throw the headers away, you've still got 100 terabytes of data a day, every day. Uh, and what are you going to do with 100 terabytes that makes it worth keeping or analyzing? Well, that's an interesting question. That brought us to uh, a slightly more detailed uh, version, which doesn't map exactly to what we were just looking at, but it's more of a, a stack view of this activity. Um, three layers. Uh, IBM doesn't play particularly at this layer. Um, there we, we work with a lot of partners, people like Schneider Electric, Honeywell, um, Siemens, uh, Philips, uh, a number of the engineering companies in that kind of space. We begin to get more active uh, at this operational level, and, and this is really sort of our, our sweet spot up here, um, heavy duty information management and, and analytics. So this is the, the area of, um, of real-time activities uh, where you typically find hard control systems, um, lots of sensors, uh, actuators, um, SCADA systems to some extent, although they, they tend to show up more up here, uh, running on uh, effectively dedicated buses of some kind. And this is actually where I, my career started with CERN hmm, many years ago, almost 40 years ago, uh, building uh, control systems for one of the what was then the big particle accelerator. Um, but today we want to take this, if I can call this loosely real time, um, some of the information that's flowing in the real time space into a space that is time dependent, but certainly not hard real time, um, but where we can begin to look in a slightly more relaxed way at what is being managed down here by the scale systems. Um, and this is where you start to, to begin to find the beginnings of, of workflow um, and integration data archiving, collection of that. Um, and eventually we want to bring some of this data, uh, we're filtering heavily, maybe at least an order of magnitude or two as we go up here, um, 
into uh, what I think IBM would like to think of as an enterprise environment here. Um, massive data storage systems, data warehouses, and then things that we would recognize as business applications where you're beginning to look at what in reality is more the management of the systems down here than their control, to be quite honest. Um, so this is a picture that, that emerged uh, and, and has sort of formed the, the conceptual reference model that we've used for the last five, four or five years as we've been building this stuff out. <coughs> A critical step in this, so we, we were looking at this really from the point of view of uh, a number of discrete areas. So one was smart metering for electricity, another one was uh, water management, uh, how to collect and treat and distribute and dispose of water in a, in a domestic uh, use, for example. Industrial process control, um, I'm trying to think of a few other examples, public safety, certainly another one. And we, what we were looking for, what, what the reason I'd gotten into this, was we were looking to see you know, are there some common patterns uh, across those kinds of applications. And, and the answer was very much yes. And so it became clear that you could build a, a stack, a platform, if you like, um, that would connect to the outside world um, and could have applications built on top of it to perform particular a a activities like um, integrating alternative energy into a grid, for example. So that's not an, not an example that I actually had in this stack. What, what happened interestingly though in Abu Dhabi in the Emirates, I had been asked to go in there and, and help some people working on a, on a green data center, an energy efficient data center. And we looked around to see what was going on here and uh, the, the Emirate had decided to build this new city called Mazdar. Um, which is still going ahead. It's a fairly small city. This is about a mile and a half square, so two and a half square miles altogether. Um, it is in the desert. It's basically all sand out here. Um, it is close to the, uh, the Gulf. Um, this is part of the Gulf here. You're very close to the coastline at this point. Um, and in the desert, but close to the Gulf, they decided to build this new city as a kind of technology showcase. Um, and it was a very, very inspirational activity uh, when it began. It's a little bit less inspirational today, but it's still pretty good. Um, it had the goal of being a net zero city. It was going to um, produce all of its own energy from solar sources, so solar thermal, photovoltaic, maybe a bit of geothermal, but I don't think they ever found any. Um, and with that energy, it had to run the cooling systems. You definitely need cooling in this part of the world. It would make water, uh, taking salt water and making it into drink, drinkable water, potable water. Uh, it would run a very innovative transportation system. Uh, and then it would do everything else. It would keep the lights on, it would run the computers, it would run the home entertainment systems and so forth. Um, and what we realized uh, in one of those aha moments, probably around August of 2008, uh, was that these discrete towers that we had been thinking about actually all come together in a city. Uh, and that, moreover, they interact with one another. This is a complex systems problem. Uh, and the scenario that we used to illustrate this to, uh, to the people at Mazdar was what we call the sandstorm scenario. This area gets sandstorms. They don't happen every week. Uh, they may, on average, be about once a month or a half a dozen times a year. Uh, and when you get a sandstorm, uh, essentially, uh, it gets very dark. Uh, the, the, uh, the sunlight is not getting through. So your solar thermal and your photovoltaic systems are not producing energy anymore. Um, now, there were plans at that time to have some storage of energy, but it's very hard to store electricity effectively. And so our question to the, or at least our, our hypothesis here was, how would you allocate the available energy to those needs? running a cooling system, making water, running a transportation system, keeping the lights on. How do you decide that problem? Uh, now, energy is stored in various forms. Some of it is stored in batteries as electricity. Some of it is stored as cold. Uh, you're familiar with storing hot in hot water tanks. Well, in this area, you store cold in cold water tanks. Um, water, you have storage tanks for water, water supplies. So how do you decide now how to keep that city running during a period in which you have uh, much, much reduced uh, energy sources. 
And that was the genesis of this thing, which we call Manara. Uh, a Manara is um, a, a lighthouse, if you're familiar with, uh, um, I've forgotten the name, um, Muslim temples, I've forgotten what they're called. Someone, somebody knows. <laughs> It'll come back in a minute. Um, but but you, you may well be familiar with these very tall towers um, that at night time certainly have lights on the top. Um, mosques, right, mosques have these towers. Uh, and this was meant to be sort of a, a lighthouse for the, the uh, management system for the city, which would uh, support on top of a, an operational platform um, a number of different areas uh, of uh, activity within the city, some of, most of which perhaps would be public, but there might be some private services in here. And you would have this, this thing at the top here that would essentially be a, uh, an integration space for these uh, activities that, that are being run for the city. And that was the point where this, this really first came together. That led us to a view just a few months later of something called a city command center. I personally never liked the word command center. Eventually it becomes something else, as you'll see. But you begin to see now the, the familiar uh, utilities, services within a city showing up. Um, we weren't proposing to build the smart grid system at the instrumentation level, uh, but what we wanted to do was talk to that instrumentation. And the same in, in terms of water and buildings and so forth. So IBM, for example, doesn't make a, uh, a building management system, but we do integrate uh, other people's building management systems um, and to essentially bring uh, through open standards interfaces, to the extent those things exist, information up into what effectively is that sort of top third of the stack that I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, that led us then, that kind of thought got us then into a number of other kinds of activities. So here's the city of Stockholm in Sweden, capital of Sweden. Uh, the old city built on a number of islands, uh, built with very dense, narrow streets, uh, very unsuited for 20, 21st century traffic. And so has in the last 10, 15 years, suffered enormously from traffic congestion, from roads that, that feed into the central area um, where the traffic simply could not make its way through here. And what the city decided to do was to essentially put a cordon around that old town area with gateways, uh, which are in effect um, toll gates, um, using video cameras to do license plate recognition, uh, and to charge a fee. It was around uh, initially around $10 a day uh, to bring a vehicle into this area. And there are other cities uh, around the world, in England, uh, London is perhaps one of the ones I know best uh, into this. And they ran it as an experiment for uh, nine months and then measured it to see what the impact had been. And you effectively had, had a 25% reduction in the amount of traffic. What, what isn't in here is the consequence of that was that the waiting times in getting through were reduced by about 50%. But you got other benefits as well. And, in particular, it generated a good revenue stream that was plowed back into public transportation. And uh, Sweden, as it turned out, took a vote on whether to continue with this. Sweden, you might know, has about the highest level of taxation anywhere in the world. And they voted to add one more tax to it because it made life in central Stockholm um, so much more pleasant. That kind of scheme is a great example of uh, this, this idea of smart um, so this is, uh, if, you live, if you've been on the East Coast, uh, you may have seen these gantries, the Easy Pass system. Uh, today mainly uses uh, an RFID device. Um, it's not quite free flow, but it's certainly flow. Um, this is in Singapore, electronic road pricing system. It is a free flow system. You just drive underneath these gantries. Uh, again, it uses RFID. And these are built as transaction systems. They're built to collect tolls. And the toll uh, may have an interesting uh, impact on, on how people decide to, to drive. And from an IT point of view, a transaction system isn't terribly complicated. But what it does as a side effect is it, it creates a very detailed amount of information very precisely about the movement of vehicles through a specific location at a specific time. And uh, about four years ago, around this time, uh, we were uh, looking at Mazdar, the 
land transportation agency in Singapore had come to IBM, to our research group, and said, you know, we have all this data piling up on the disk about transportation in the city. Is there anything useful you could do with it? And our, our math sciences people looked at this and they said, yeah, you can see patterns in here that are predictors of future average vehicle speeds in certain areas of the city. Um, so what emerged out of this was a tool that, so Singapore has a fairly large number of these. Um, and by looking at the patterns of traffic flow through them, what we were able to build is a tool that with something like a 90%, 95% confidence level predicts the average traffic speed in regions of Singapore. Now, one average traffic speed that is of great interest is zero. Uh, that means you have congestion. So what we have is a way then of predicting where congestion is likely to occur uh, up to about an hour ahead. Um, that allows the traffic managers in the traffic control center to take a number of steps. They can send messages to message boards in, through the cities. They can send messages to navigation systems in vehicles. And they can do something that, as far as I know, no other city in the world can do, which is they can change the, the road pricing in real time. Uh, this is an old picture. If you see the newer pictures, it actually shows you on the, uh, on the gantry what the current pricing is for going on that stretch of road. And that has some impact then on pe where people decide to drive. So sending a signal changes the behavior of the citizens, and that's a key thought in smart cities. Yeah. You can go on beyond this um, and start to look at, at even higher level systems than, um, that, that you could build with this. But this idea of picking up a stream of data that was generated as a byproduct from some transaction system, looking for insights in it, and then using those insights to improve the way that you're managing the operation of the entire system. That's the central thought in here. Going on from that, we've done a lot of work in transportation. Transportation in general is a very uh, important area. I, I would expect you have people working on transportation too. It is one of the biggest problems that cities face all around the world. Um, there is enormous competition to be the city with the worst traffic. Um, almost every city I go to claims to be to have the world's worst traffic congestion. Toronto is certainly very high on that list. Uh, London used to be, it's, it's managed to sink down a little bit now. Um, so there are many things that, that we've been able to do in this space. Um, one interesting study we did for a little town not far from here called Dubuque uh, in Iowa. Anybody know Dubuque? Uh, 60,000 people on the Mississippi. 100 years ago, very important city for machining wood. Float logs down from Wisconsin, uh, machine them into furniture, doors, staircases, window frames, all this stuff. That industry died 30 years ago. It went away. I, I know how that feels. I was born in a city in England called Sheffield, um, which had a steel industry. It was the inspiration for Pittsburgh, another industry that died. And it's a terrible thing when that happens to a city. But Dubuque is, is coming back very strong. Uh, we started working with them three or four years ago, and they've become kind of a living lab. Um, we have a wonderful relationship there. One of the things we did 2010, 2011, was look at their public transportation system. Uh, and by asking for uh, volunteers into an opt-in system, you can get origin and destination by tracking people's phones, if they let you. From the origin and destination, you can find out where is it people want to travel. Where do they live? Where do they go to work? Where do they go for entertainment? What you could see very clearly from this was where people live today and where they work today isn't where they lived and worked 30 years ago. But the bus routes haven't changed. So although this city, city is only about five uh, miles across, it was taking people 40, 45 minutes to go from one side to the other to get to where they were. And we were able to point out to the city that if you remap the routes, you could actually make people's journeys shorter, uh, and it, you would only need 30 percent, uh, you'd need 30 percent less capacity in that system. So just by looking at where people want to go, observing the real world, um, and then mapping the service to that, uh, you can improve both the experience and the cost of delivering that experience. Well, 60,000 people um, is, is not a big example. 
But what we've now done is taken that approach, those methods, to the city of Istanbul. That's two orders of magnitude more people. That's a much more interesting problem. So lots of work there. Um, I think I'll skip over this. Um, here's a one around energy. I saw a lot of interest here around uh, smart grid. Uh, and we've been very active in that. I hope to talk to some of the people in the smart grid space before I leave. Um, we took part in a uh, collaboration about uh, four or five years ago now in um, the Olympic Peninsula, which is sort of the top left-hand corner of the lower 48. Uh, it's sort of west of Seattle. Uh, it's a peninsula, as the name suggests. Uh, it's one of the last areas of first growth forest in the United States. Uh, is has wonderful coastlines. It is uh, of enormous natural environmental importance. Um, but there are some small communities that live in there. Um, they have one electric power line that goes in. And because it is such an area of natural beauty and environmental importance, they're not going to get another one anytime soon. So the question begins to arise of what would they do when electrical demand begins to approach the capacity of that line? Now, this is not a question about average electrical demand. It is a question about peak electrical demand, because it's when you hit the peak that you're going to encounter this problem. So the question that was given to this consortium is, uh, is there a way of um, smoothing demand? Now, there are many approaches that have been taken to smoothing demand. Um, this one, uh, I, as far as I know, was pretty uh, innovative in its day. Um, it's now being rolled out on a much bigger scale. It was originally done for 120 homes and some industrial uh, energy consumers. <coughs> and uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about this. But basically, um, what we did here was to allow, effectively, we gave the homeowners uh, a thermostat with a knob on it. I mean, it wasn't a real thermostat, but imagine a virtual knob. Um, if you turn it all the way up, um, your house will always be as hot or as cool as you want it to be, but you'll pay a lot for energy. If you turn it all the way uh, down the other end, um, your temperature will have more variability in it, but you will be paying the minimum amount for energy. And effectively, what we allowed the, uh, the utility to do was to read, um, see, there are actually a number of things. There's a tumble dryer, there's a hot water unit, um, um, sorry, this is a hot water unit, and there's the, the heating and, and air conditioning that goes on as well. And if I just look at the heating and air conditioning one, we allowed the, uh, the utility to read the average temperature inside the, the home every five minutes. Uh, and we had arranged a system based on a PC that allowed the, the uh, consumers to specify what was their comfort range, how wide a variation in uh, temperature were they willing to tolerate. Um, because if, they, if the house is going to be within that range, um, then essentially their, their system is going to buy energy at the minimum price it can find. Um, but as it strays outside that range, it gets colder in the winter, it gets hotter in the summer. Um, the, the price that, that that home is willing to pay for, you, for energy um, will increase as you go further and further away from that comfort zone. Uh, and in effect, um, those prices then become bids into a secondary energy market um, that is cleared every five minutes. So every five minutes, in effect, um, these 120 homes, actually it was only a third of them because one was a group control, um, control group and the other was doing uh, time-based pricing, um, were effective. They were putting in bids for how much they would pay for energy for the next five minutes. And the utility, on the other hand, was resetting the price of energy uh, according to what, was, uh, what it was able to buy from its uh, primary energy market there. Um, and so every five minutes you clear this, and depending on whether your bid was greater than their price, your air conditioning will or will not run. Um, and the effect of that is that you reduce the peakiness of demand on the 24-hour cycle by about 50%, uh, which was a great relief uh, that, that, well, A, the experiment worked, but B, um, meant that the, the people living out there could, uh, could breathe carefully. Uh, calmly for uh, quite a few years in the future. This is now being repeated at the level of about 100,000 100, homes uh, in uh, continuation of this, this uh, consortium. Another thing we did in Dubuque with energy, um, 
talked about transportation, I've talked about energy, where you use price signals as the feedback mechanism uh, in, the, in the control loop here. But we also want to know, are there other kinds of signals that you can send that, that have uh, an impact on consumer behavior? This is an experiment on social uh, signals here. Um, this is a um, uh, portal, it's a web page that um, I think, I forget, forget how many people, I think we had about 250 in this, in this uh, experiment. Um, so each of those 250 people, uh, homes, um, could look at their energy consumption. This is energy, we've done the same for water consumption as well. This is, um, is, is looking at weekly consumption, um, going back over about a year. Um, this is looking at 24-hour consumption. Um, it's, been it's been demonstrated many times around the world now that if you give people feedback on their consumption of, of almost anything, um, it will tend to drop. Um, it's why you see it in, in certain cars. BMW likes to put in a, a gauge that tells you what your current um, uh, mi uh, miles per gallon is. And here's one. This is not quite real time. I think there's a delay of about 15 minutes or so. But just giving people that feedback uh, produces a reduction in energy consumption of uh, 10 to 15 percent in various experiments around the world. What we also did, though, was we, out of the 250 or so homes, we, we formed teams. And we encouraged the teams to compete with one another, uh, not only in, in how they used energy, but, but what uh, mitigation uh, activities they might engage in, like adding insulation or uh, changing um, the, the kinds of light bulbs that you use, for example. Um, and that added about another 10% or so to energy reduction in this way. We've done other kinds of experiments looking at social behavior, uh, or social norms as a way of changing uh, behavior here. So by uh, 15, 16 months ago, that command center had evolved into an operation center. Uh, and this became a product. Uh, and, but you can see the same kind of structure, uh, gateways to connect us into the control systems, in effect, the operating systems of uh, a, a wide range of real-world activities, um, internal service buses to, to make that information widely shareable, uh, a semantic model so that we can allow different applications to make sense of the data coming from uh, many different uh, areas, uh, many tools for analysis, visualization, setting thresholds, uh, being able to trigger uh, standard operating procedures when certain thresholds are exceeded, um, uh, introduce GIS support in here because a lot of this will want to be visualized in terms of maps and so on, um, and then providing a top API on top of which you can start to put some of the kinds of applications that I've just been talking about. Um, out of that grew, and I'm not going to go through these in any detail whatsoever, uh, a, a, an increasingly rich portfolio of the kinds of use cases that, that we can support for uh, various sorts of efficiency activities in, in cities. Um, what that abstractly uh, reflects is um, what I hope many of you would know as an OODA loop, um, observing from the real world, uh, of orienting the information that, that we've captured here, um, using models and, and uh, predictive tools to forecast uh, how things might evolve, allowing uh, operators to have various scenarios uh, for this modeling and, and prediction, um, leading them to be able to take uh, decisions on how to change the operation of that system, the traffic control system, for example, and then being able to execute <coughs> that. So that is, uh, in effect, uh, what we're doing here that we're bringing information from a water system, for example, into a platform where we can uh, essentially make sense of it, uh, do that prediction on future demand for energy. Um, that might then allow us to change the way in which we schedule pumping, which is a significant uh, energy consumer, uh, back in the water management system down here. Um, so that's our OODA loop uh, again for a, a single agency, in this case, the water management agency. Um, one way that, that you can imagine using that in, uh, this is a public safety example here. Um, so here's a, here's a scenario. Um, at one point, uh, there's an accident. A fire hydrant is uh, taken out of use uh, by a road, uh, by a car accident. 
Um, that is reported through public safety. It generates a message here. There's a protocol called CAP, Common Alerting Protocol, um, that allows us to essentially broadcast or, or narrowcast, I should say, really, um, that kind of information to a group of agencies that are interested in certain kinds of uh, information about the real world. Um, Subsequently, uh, in that same uh, road, uh, a fire breaks out, a uh, 911 call, uh, and uh, fire trucks are dispatched. Um, but the, the fire marshal is notified that this hydrant is out of operation, uh, and therefore they're going to have to run hoses further uh, than they might expect to. Uh, and they might also want to bring a water truck in case uh, there isn't a nearby hydrant anyway. So there's a way of coordinating information between different kinds of agencies. This is most widely used in, um, in the city of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we had uh, been in a conversation there with the city, this is about 18 months ago. Um, at a time, that was, that was May, June of 2010 more than two and a half years ago, not 18 months, um, we were having a discussion about innovation in cities with, uh, with some of the mayor's team. Um, and, and the first part of that conversation is, um, is usually helping them to understand that IBM is not a computer company. Um, yeah, we, we do have a little $20 billion business selling computers, but the other 80, 90% of it uh, actually comes from solving problems. And so we spend some time explaining to them how we can solve problems. Uh, the next morning, unexpectedly, um, well, when we reconvened that workshop, um, the mayor of Rio, Mayor Perez, walked in the room and said, I heard from some of my people that you can solve problems. Let me tell you about my biggest problem. Uh, and he described uh, this uh, <coughs> incredible flooding event they had had about two months earlier, uh, when the city, in 24 hours, received almost a foot of water. And if you, I've never been to Rio, but if you've seen the pictures, it's you know, lots of big hills. Uh, you put a foot of water onto those hills, it doesn't stay there, it runs down into the valleys, and this is what you get. Um, you get flooding, but you also get mudslides. Um, and it was mudslides that really did a huge amount of damage, particularly in the poorer areas, in the favelas, where construction is weak, and, and a mudslide will destroy uh, a poorly constructed building like this. So he said, you know, can you solve this problem for me? Right? 2014, I have the World Cup. 2016, I have the Summer Olympics. I, I have to be able to manage the city better than I can do today. And so we built him a, a control room. Um, very fancy. The, uh, I, th I think a lot of this is really more for show than for practical need, but it's a very fancy control room. And they use it now for coordinating um, about 30 different emergency response teams using, if I go back here, um, using this kind of, of message passing system here that allows everybody to get what we like to call a single view of the truth. Um, a second thing we added in there is a weather forecasting system that does a 24 hour weather forecast uh, for every 30 minutes on a one kilometer square grid. Uh, typical uh, weather forecast resolution in this space would be every six hours on a 20 kilometer square grid. So you're getting a lot more detailed information out of this. Um, so we can, uh, to a large extent, we can actually track individual clouds uh, within this. From that and the interaction between those clouds and the underlying hills, we can predict rainfall. Not only can we predict rainfall, but we can predict where that rain is going to fall. Um, and that produces maps like this. And again, knowing the topography, uh, if we know where the water is falling uh, on, the, on the hills, we can also predict where it's going to go to, and now we can predict flooding. So we can uh, make reasonably good uh, predictions now about uh, when storms are coming, uh, where uh, emergency crews are, should be stationed. We've done similar things in New York uh, for the local utility there. We do forecasts for, um, what's it called, PG, uh, no, Con Edison. Um, during, particularly during this time of the year, we, we can do forecasts for wind, rain, snow, and ice. Um, and we don't just tell them you're going to get wind, snow, rain, or ice, because no, that's not very helpful. What we can do, what we've been able to do by going back, looking through their historical records, is to say, 
you will get this kind of damage in this region. So they know where to station a repair crew, they know what kind of equipment they're going to be repairing, um, and, and the overall extent of that damage from a particular storm. So these are kinds of things we can do today. We know where the data is coming from, uh, in almost all cases here. It's coming from a water treatment plant, it's coming from a smart grid, it's coming from a transportation system. It's mainly numbers. Um, it's pretty accurate. There's a certain amount of cleansing that you have to do. GPS data is terrible. You need to do a lot of cleaning up on that kind of thing. When we first did this in Dublin, where we have a big lab for this um, kind of thing, uh, <coughs> it was telling us that the buses were actually running in the river, which is visibly not true. Um, we have high confidence in those sources. Um, they are generally reliable. Um, and we know what the context of that information is. Um, it relates to traffic uh, in a given street uh, on a given day. And it's primarily about the infrastructure itself. But in the future, we're going to be looking at uh, a much wider range. We're going to be looking at a lot more information coming from people uh, from, from things that we might think of as virtual sensors. We, we might be doing image uh, analysis on surveillance cameras to understand, use that to understand uh, traffic flow or to understand where their parking spaces, for example. Um, a lot of that is information from non-trusted sources. Right? We don't really know who those people are. Um, why should we trust um, that person's information? If they tweet something, why should we trust that tweet? Um, this comes to the fore in emergency management where uh, in the last several major disasters uh, social media have been a, a valuable source of information about what is going on um, but the emergency management authorities are, are mistrustful of it because they don't know quite who is generating that information there. So we have to figure out how to deal with this. And our approach to this generally goes by this name of of sense making, which is, let me give you an analogy or a metaphor at least here. Um, a colleague who is working on this talks about this problem as let's take 10 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzles, and we're going to take all of those jigsaw puzzles and empty the box out on a table. We're going to throw the boxes away so we don't know what the picture looks like. And now I'm going to take each one of those pieces and say, where does that fit? And, and where does that fit in this context means, is that piece of information out of this enormous stream that we can tap into now, is that relevant to my decision making? Because we're now we're not looking at uh, how much energy is Colin consuming uh, in the next five minutes. We're looking at a strange piece of information from a source that we don't understand uh, that may or may not be relevant. I'll give you a very practical example of this from our supply chain management, which is one of the areas that this kind of problem shows up in. Uh, in December last year, you might recall, um, Thailand began to have very heavy rainfall in the northern part of the country. Um, and as that propagated down the rivers towards the ocean, you began to get flooding in major cities in, in southern Thailand. And our supply chain management team uh, is constantly monitoring what's going on in the world, reading newspapers, uh, watching the web, watching television. Uh, and they saw that happening. Uh, and the, the initial reaction was, well, hmm, that's a great shame. We're sorry about that. But uh, IBM doesn't actually have any manufacturing in that area. So you know, it's not really our problem. But it wasn't long before somebody uh, remembered that, uh, yeah, but IBM buys uh, most of its disk drives from Western Digital. And Western Digital had 40% of its manufacturing capacity in Northern Thailand. So now, through the miracle of the World Wide Web and global supply chains, right, um, our manufacturing plant in, in Rochester, New York, sorry, Rochester, Minnesota, um, is connected to a disaster in Thailand indirectly. And, and this is a characteristic of the world. We saw this in Japan last in, um, was that, that was also last year. Um, I spent a lot of time in Japan last year after the earthquake. And, you know, there we had very clearly seen that you know, if you disrupt transportation in the northern part of Japan, the effect of that is felt in the car industry in Sweden and Detroit 
uh, and in mobile phone manufacturing throughout East Asia. Right? So we, we live in a connected world and, and mostly we think that's a wonderful thing. Right? We have lots of friends all over the world, we have industries that are globalized, uh, but it connects us to bad things as well as good things. <coughs> this is one of the bad things. So this is um, the kind of thing um, that might be happening on any given day. It runs from relatively minor things like fog at Heathrow to um, bomb hoaxes or other terrorist activities, perhaps um, to earthquakes in Japan. All of that flow of information um, needs to be sorted through uh, to find out, you know, is it in fact something that's relevant to my context, to how I need to make decisions about the management of my business or, or my city, in fact. Um, and it takes some very interesting and innovative uh, areas um, it grew out of work that, that had been done probably 15 years ago now in Las Vegas. Um, so Las Vegas casinos have, an well, Las Vegas casinos have many interesting problems. Um, but one of them uh, are the people called card shops, who are maybe card counters. I, I never play cards, so I have no idea how this works. Um, but there are people who can uh, get better than average odds uh, by playing various kinds of games, I believe. Uh, and obviously the casinos don't like this. Uh, and so when these people become recognized, they're blacklisted and, and not allowed into the casino in the future. So what do these people do? Well, they invent a new identity and they come back under this new identity. And uh, so a colleague uh, was asked, you know, could you produce a system um, that would help us to determine whether the person who is coming in under this identity might have previously come in under some other identity. Um, and it turns out, yes, you can do that. Um, because if you, uh, you know, these people, certainly at the high stake tables um, are known, they, they are registered. Um, and if you look back into their history, you'll find perhaps that, you know, two people with very different names, uh, but strangely enough, five years ago, they, they had the same telephone number. Hmm, how can that be? Maybe they are, in fact, the same person. So that kind of, uh, the way that works is by treating questions as data. I think something Google learned some time ago. Um, you ask a question and that, the fact that you're asking that question is in fact a piece of data. Uh, and this is the way in which you begin to understand you know, what is it that you're connected to in the big world out there. Well, that's the, more or less the end. Um, we talked about OODA loops. Uh, we talked about, uh, well, we didn't actually talk about improving the usability. Um, this is a, you're not really in the space, I think, but I think this is a, a perspective on cities that I would love to see some work done on, is what we're building here, in effect, is a, is a user interface between the city's infrastructure and the services that they provide and the citizens. And, and by that, I don't mean the app that goes on your iPhone. I mean that there is a, there's a set of digital interfaces there that allow information to flow in both directions. Allows the citizen to discover um, what are the services, what's the functionality of, this, of the city, um, how is it doing uh, at 7.30 this morning, do I take the same bus that I took yesterday or should I be taking a different bus? And conversely, it allows the city to learn what is it the people are, are trying to do, not as individuals usually, but in general, what is it that people are trying to do, where do they want to travel? Um, and, and that leads to this thought here. Um, you think of transportation systems going, they go back several millennia. The way you run a transportation system is you publish a timetable. And if I want to go from Southampton to New York on the boat, it's my job to be on the dock at Southampton just before it leaves. That's the way we run transportation systems. But now in cities, we actually can turn that around because what the old system does is it makes the travelers organize their lives around the service that you're providing. What we can do today is turn it around and we can organize that service around what those people are trying to do in their lives. You start to see cities uh, beginning to experiment with as, um, what's often called a, a rapid transportation system, a rapid transit system. A lot of what we do is about cross agency inefficiencies. Uh, for, for historical reasons, um, I actually would love to do research on one day if I had the time. Was, um, city agencies act very much as independent silos with very little lateral communication. And one of the things that we, we try to do is to get them to share more information. 
Um, it will help them individually do their jobs better. There is a movement that you might know of um, that is also trending in that direction called open data, um, which is publishing data uh, to the public. Um, but that begins to introduce the thought that cities ought to be encouraging the flow of information um, within their own organizations. Uh, and lastly, um, this problem of how can we take uh, even more advantage of the huge flows of information that are becoming available to support our decision making in cities. So I will stop there. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mm. Okay. Yeah, as in the electronic jump. Mm -hmm. Yep, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the, you know, the, the, okay, I'll put this back together. Um, I think that the industry is uh, solving that problem today in a, in a, in a rather bad way. Uh, a lot of the junk is theoretically exported uh, to, mainly I think to China for, recovery, uh, but I think that recovery is done in a very uh, ineffective way. Um, there should be enough value in that material to actually make it worthwhile doing a, a much better job. If you look at the, the density of gold uh, in, a, in a PC, um, it is far higher than the density of gold in raw ore, um, and so it should be worth extracting that and some of the other rare earth metals and, and recovering these things. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near that today, um, but certainly as devices proliferate, uh, we, we, I think we'll get deeper and deeper into that. Yeah. Good so, so when you consider the environmental impact of you know, making a smart city that we are going to reduce the environmental impact, does it mean that we are going to have a bad impact like 30, 40 years later? Like, are we just going to buy time? There's a book I recommend to you. Uh, it's a short book. Um, it's called The Conundrum. Write it up here. And if I remember rightly, it's David Owens. David is a journalist, writes for the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, so it's a journalist book, it's not an academic book um, or a non profit book. Um, this is a, an area with many paradoxes in it, <coughs> like paradoxes about local food, for example. Uh, and, and his point of, his book, he had written an earlier one called The, uh, the Green Metropolis, which is also a good read as well. And this one, Conundrum, is kind of a continuation of that thought. Um, anybody have an idea what, what The Green Metropolis is? It is a specific city. Um, that he's talking about that is an exemplar for what he sees as the, the future way in which we should consume energy and other resources. Any, anybody have a guess? No? It's a large city. It's on the east coast of the United States. You have all heard of it. Somebody? New York. New York. <laughs> ah, New York is a very green <coughs> city. It consumes, the average New York citizen consumes 25% uh, of the national average. How can that be? All those people, all those lives. Well, it's because they live in 300 square foot apartments. They don't have cars, they walk. Right? In a 300 square foot apartment, you don't have space for a lot of stuff. Right? <laughs> you don't have half an acre of lawn to water you can't consume very much energy. And, and, and the conundrum is about, you know, that, so David's approach is, is that the congestion management, making the flow of traffic through a city easier, this is absolutely the wrong thing to do. We should make it harder for traffic. <laughs> Why? Because we want people to take public transportation, which is, from an energy point of view, far more efficient. Um, so it's, it's very many, many, many paradoxes in this space. Are there any 
other questions? Yes. Um, well, <clears throat> if you look at, at new cities, uh, go to China, go to India, Middle East, um, other parts of the world, um, they are building this stuff in. You know, the, the best electrical distribution system in the world is state grid in China. Um, second best one is maybe Japan, but uh, certainly China is very, very good at this stuff. Uh, and it will come more slowly in, in older cities that, that where you have to go in and retrofit it. Um, this is one of the areas where small cities, I think, have advantages. That's why we love to work with Dubuque. Um, they can be very nimble and, and move uh, very quickly. We actually did a project um, 2007 to about the end of last year. Um, we installed smart water, smart electricity meters for an entire country. Now, it's a very little country. Um, it's the island of Malta in the, in the Mediterranean. <laughs> There's only 400,000 people, right? But, you know, some, some countries will move faster. When we started this uh, as a business, spring of 2009, we were actually astonished at the level of interest uh, that this initiative drew. Because w what we thought we were doing here, and what we still are in some senses too, is we were helping cities to reduce operating costs. We were going to make them greener, whatever that might be. Um, we were going to help the traffic flow better. Um, but it, and it took us a couple of months to understand that what was driving this level of interest had nothing to do with those. Do you know what those cities are trying to do when they decide to become smart? They want to attract you, right? They want to attract people who are internet natives, who've grown up on the internet, um, who will be the innovators, the entrepreneurs of the future. It's about economic development, it's about competitiveness. Uh, as cities now find themselves not just in, in competition within their state or their region, but with cities on the other side of the planet for money, but even more than that, for talent, and your talent. So the world needs you, the world wants you, and you have a huge choice in where you go and live and work in the future. Shall we continue or stop? Sure. Yeah, um, I was wondering, like, is there, what are the implications when you, like, try to scale, like, your usage of big data down to, like, small urban stations? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think one, one of the things that, that I've never seen a good study on this, but it's always intrigued me this thought that you know, as, as IT has progressed over the last 40, 50 years, that, that it actually allows us to scale things down as, as well as scale them up. And uh, you can, the idea of a secondary energy market for 40 homes, for example, right? Um, the, the idea of having an energy market as an individual consumer is. You know, an astonishing idea. It's normally the kinds of things that Enron and, and companies at that scale uh, take part in. Um, so yes, within within individual facilities, um, you can begin to apply a lot of these things. This is what we really do in intelligent buildings. It's why we don't build building management systems per se, but we look at the building as kind of a little city and now try and apply the same sort of thinking in there. Um, Building hospitals, a good example. Sports stadiums are another great example of, of a thing that is kind of smaller. Airports, even shopping malls, um, are, are in many ways little cities. Yeah. So we do a lot of work with, with architects these days on how to integrate their thinking. Say about people flow, how do you, we can simulate, for example, the flow of individual people walking through, through a structure. Uh, in fact, an, a, 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 an interesting problem that we were asked to solve probably 10, 15 years ago now, but it's the same technique. Um, there was a new stadium built in Paris. If you ever fly into Charles de Gaulle and you go into the center of Paris, you pass by this large stadium. It's called Stade de Paris. Um, no, Stade de France. And um, I forget what the capacity of the thing is. It's maybe 30,000 people. And before you could get an occupancy certificate for this stadium, you had to prove that you could evacuate 30,000 people from it in, I think it was 20 minutes. Um, in case a fire broke out or something like this. So 
So what do you do? I mean, you could hire 30,000 people for a week and, you know, and try and run them through different exercises. <laughs> Um, but we built a, a multi-agent simulation for this right, which, uh, w that, that can incorporate different kinds of walking uh, characteristics, different kinds of, you know, some people naturally turn left, some people naturally turn right, all this kind of stuff in there and that could demonstrate that you could do this kind of thing. So I have the, well, okay, I'll let you have the last question. Go ahead. <laughs> are, are you familiar with Uh, no, I think I saw a reference to it. It was on either on the first slide this morning, but yeah, yeah, I'd be very interested to see that. Uh, our, our view on, on LEAD, by the way, um, which is, you know, is the sort of the building design and construction standard for energy efficiency, well, <coughs> gen generally, is it's a little bit like buying, when you go buy a car, a uh, new car, it comes with a sticker on the side. So this car gets 42 miles to a gallon. Uh, and this may be true, but it depends how you drive it, right? And we're about the how you drive it part of that statement, right? Um, if you make the, the most wonderful lead platinum building, but you don't manage it very well, you won't really get the benefit out of that. And what our systems are trying to do is to help you get the best efficiency out of what you've implemented, in fact. Okay, okay. I think we'll we're done. Switch over to our last speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we have a Oh, no. Oh. Uh, we have another, uh, you have a wireless presenter, but we have a, another wireless presenter. <laughs> well, so I keep losing them. Yes. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much, Taylor. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Look forward to the rest of the meeting. Okay. So we'll have a coffee break now, uh, just outside.